That brings us to this evening and our speaker. I was going to hold the book up, but it's largely pointless because there it is. Uh, the book is, of course, Children of Armenia, A Forgotten Genocide and the Century-Long Struggle for Justice. Quite obviously, it's available in the bookstore, and the author would be glad to sign copies afterwards. Just a, a brief introduction to, of our uh, speaker and the author, Michael Babelian. Michael is a graduate of the Columbia Graduate School of Journalism. He's a lawyer and a journalist. He's written for Forbes.com, American Lawyer, Legal Affairs Magazine, has been featured on NPR. He lives in New York City with his wife and his daughter. And uh, over the past couple of years, it's been a great pleasure to get to know Michael as he has been researching this book, made many trips up to Boston to do work here at Nasser and at other research centers in the area. And um, probably he would have been done with the project sooner if, I hadn't, uh, if we hadn't spent so much time talking about various things. But uh, it's an extremely interesting project. Uh, and once I learned what he was up to in his research, realized that really no one has, no one has written this book um, up to this point. It was a story that really needed to be, have someone take it on. I'm sure it's not the last word on the subject, as any book ever is the last word on any subject. It is, however, a really good read, extremely interesting and informative, and I can't imagine anyone in this room or outside of this room not reading this book with interest and learning a great deal, even about events that have happened in our own times. So I would just like to turn things over then to Michael, and we'll uh, hear what he has to say. Thank you, Mark, for that uh, generous introduction. And I just want to say that uh, that I did do a great deal of my research here at Nasser. Uh, the library was invaluable, and I couldn't have really done the book without the materials here. And over the last two years, I came here seven times, and usually spent a, a week from the hour that the place opened to when it closed up in a room upstairs. Um, so I'm grateful that Nasser existed and uh, that the library is so uh, voluminous and so thorough. Um, I'm going to read a little bit and then I'm going to give a presentation with the help of some slides. But before I do that, much of, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the book. Uh, it's about the aftermath of the genocide. And as Mark said, no one has really written about this before. And today I'll discuss the, the general themes of the book, but I wanted to let you know uh, what its narrative structure is like. Um, it's, a, it's a big topic that spans a lot of decades and many different people. Uh, Armenian struggle does not have, did not have an iconic figure like a Martin Luther King or anyone like that. So the children of Armenia I speak of are not children, and uh, it's not Armenia the country, but the broader Armenian nation. And the story is of the advocates who fought for justice for the Armenian people. So whether they are the early advocates like Vahan Kardashian and Simon Vratsyan and Bovos Nubar in the World War I era, or later day advocates uh, from the Armenian Assembly and the ANC and lawyers who sued the uh, life insurance companies and so on. It's their story, told through their personal experiences and through their emotions and the sacrifices they made. Now, one of those children uh, was a man named Gugan Yanikyan, and I want to start by reading a passage from the prologue, uh, which is about him. Gurgen Megadich Yanikyan was too focused on his mission to be concerned with his depleted finances on the morning of January 27, 1973. He owed $2,400 to creditors and was living off welfare checks and loans from friends. Yet he decided to forego a regular room and rent a cottage to impress his guests, diplomats from the Turkish consulate in Los Angeles. Though rage filled his heart, he coolly followed the plan he had mapped out months earlier. After instructing a hotel maid to clean his room and ordering a lunch to be served at noon, he groomed his woolly mustache and put on a white beret 
and brown tweed overcoat. Nanikan's vitality belied his age. At 77, he could still intimidate men half his age when standing with his barrel chest out. His hair hung back in an unkept style, mimicking the students and hippies at the local university he had spent much of his time with since his wife of 48 years had slid into unconsciousness. Deeply creased cheeks sagged at the sides of his face. His pitch black eyebrows rose steadily upward as they approached his temples, sharply contrasting with his silver mane and endowing him with a menacing countenance. Satisfied with his appearance, Yannikan filled two guns with twelve bullets apiece. His hands barely trembled. Bullets loaded, he placed a blue 25 caliber Browning he had purchased from Ott's hardware store in Santa Barbara inside a dresser drawer. He fit the other semi-automatic, a 9mm Luger pistol, into a hollowed out who's who of the West that he had carved out especially for this occasion. His inexperience with the gun, which he had fired twice since purchasing it from an army veteran 26 years earlier, did not concern him. Five days earlier, knowing that he was unlikely to return home, Yannikan had packed his bags with his life's work and checked into cottage number three, room 34 of the Biltmore Hotel. Built in 1927, the Biltmore copied the signature red tile roofs, wrought iron grillwork, and cream-colored stucco walls of the Spanish colonial architecture applied throughout Santa Barbara. Yannikian had little interest in the scenery, however. He had checked into the hotel for a different purpose. He wanted to avenge his family's loss, his people's loss, for a decades-old crime left unpunished and forgotten by the world. While he finalized lunch arrangements with the hotel staff and ensured the guns were hidden in their places, the Turkish consul and his assistant drove up to Santa Barbara. That they were married with children, or that neither man was alive at the time of the genocide, mattered little to Yannikyan. To him, they were symbols of the enduring injustice committed against the Armenians. When the diplomats approached room 34 of the Biltmore at 11.30 a.m., and he can read them with a bow. Now I'm going to jump back in time uh, to 1915 and also tell you a little bit more about Google and Anikyan. As a civil engineering student at the University of Moscow after the outbreak of World War I, Yanikyan heard news of atrocities taking place against the Armenians throughout 1915. Eager to find his family, whom he had not heard from since the outbreak of the war, Yannikan traveled to the Caucasus during the spring of 1915 to sign up with an Armenian volunteer regiment fighting alongside the Russian army. Over the next few weeks, the men of Yannikan's unit often traveled on foot and when they were lucky, on horseback. Everywhere they went, he saw mutilated bodies, abandoned homes, and destroyed churches. In his hometown, he found his father's business and childhood home, like the rest of the Armenian quarter, burned down. Water fountains flowed red with blood. Decapitated bodies littered the churchyard where he had spent his Sunday afternoons as a child. Searching through the remains, Yannikyan recognized a large mole on the face of a boy whose head had been hacked in two with a hatchet, like a watermelon. It was his 12-year-old nephew. Next to his nephew lay his brother-in-law's severed head. The large mustache still in place, but his body nowhere to be found. Yannikyan searched in vain through the mangled corpses for the body so that he could bury the two in the family plot at the local cemetery. He placed his family's remains alongside his grandmother's burial site. They were among the few Armenians to receive a formal funeral. Twenty-four other members of his extended family rotted in unmarked graves somewhere in the Ottoman Empire, perhaps killed swiftly with a blow from an axe, or perhaps the victims of a slow death. In all, the Ottoman Empire slaughtered one and a half million Armenians and evicted 500,000 more from lands inhabited for 2,500 years. <coughs> 
The tragedy would come to be known as the Armenian Genocide. <clears throat> the reason I started the book with that scene and why I read it here is because Gurgen Yanikian's tale comes at a flashpoint in the post-genocide story. But it also, he symbolizes the two things that are unique to the Armenian experience. Uh, unlike any other genocide of the 20th century, the Armenian genocide, which was very well known while it was taking place, disappeared from the world's consciousness. And that's something unique to the Armenian experience. And of course, I'm sure all of you know about Turkish denial, uh, where the perpetrators not only got away with their crime, but came to deny the very existence of that crime. And Yanikan was, was responding uh, to these two challenges. Now, I'm going to have a few articles here. They're all from 1915, and they're the headlines uh, from the New York Times. And this first one says, Morgenthau intercedes, and this is from the spring of 1915. Uh, Morgenthau was uh, the U.S. ambassador to the Ottoman Empire, and soon after, the Young Turks rounded up Armenian leadership, May of April 1915. He went to them, and he tried to intervene on their behalf. Obviously, it was to no avail. The next article talks of wholesale massacres. Then we have an extinction. And then we get into the body counts. 500,000 Armenians and then 800,000 Armenians. In fact, in 1915 alone, the New York Times had more than 100 articles describing the genocide. And every major newspaper in the United States talked about this issue. Now, the genocide inspired the first ever major international humanitarian aid movement. We remember the tsunami from a couple of years ago. Uh, people from across the world sent money to uh, victims in Asia. And when I was a child in the 1980s, there was the Ethiopian famine. And Americans sent money abroad. And uh, the pop singers like Michael Jackson and Lionel Richie created the We Are the World song. But well before all of these campaigns, the Armenians were the first, first beneficiaries of a major international humanitarian aid movement. And the United States was at the forefront of this effort. In fact, the United States sent $116 million of aid and 45,000 American relief workers administered uh, refugee camps and orphanages throughout the Middle East. Now that $116 million is about a billion and a half in today's terms, so just to give you an idea of how unprecedented that was considering there was no example to build on. Now ultimately, uh, this effort culminated in an institution called the New East Foundation. <clears throat> and this is one of their posters, one of their fundraising posters. And these posters were plastered throughout the United States. And remember, this is the age before the internet, television, and radio. So they often had posters like these and newspaper ads to raise money. And the New East Foundation served as a model for the USAID and the Peace Corps decades later. Now, in order to raise money, they relied on um, iconic images that would be popular to Americans. So here you have a Lady Liberty protecting an Armenian girl, and you have Uncle Sam. Now, this was a real grassroots effort in the United States. Uh, proceeds from the 1916 Harvard-Yale football game went to Armenian-related charities. In 1917, 30,000 American Sunday schools raised a million dollars. And of that 116 million, 25 million came from the U.S. government. Now, this humanitarian effort was also the first time that celebrities were used to raise money for such a charitable effort. Uh, the boy sitting next to Charlie Chaplin is a boy named Jackie Coogan. And he was a silent film star in the 1920s. And later on in life, he went on to play uh, Uncle Fester in The Addams Family. But in the 1920s, he led what was called a milk campaign. And he would urge children who came to the theater to watch his movies to, build, to bring uh, cans of condensed milk, which were then shipped abroad to Armenian orphans. So you had this massive humanitarian e effort, but you also had a great deal of political advocacy in the United States. So what were they advocating for? Well, after World War I, the Ottoman Empire was among the defeated powers in World War I. And the victors of the war, the United States, Great Britain, France, 
uh, they were determining what to do uh, with the empire. And the Armenians had gone asking for reparations, uh, trials of the perpetrators of the genocide, as well as the establishment of a homeland. Now, a lot of this advocacy was done here in the United States. And this is an event in February 1919. It's a gala uh, at the Plaza Hotel in New York City. Uh, anyone familiar with that hotel? It's on the corner of Fifth Avenue and Central Park. It's still there. And so at this event, there were 400 people in attendance. The humanitarian aid workers, the people raising money for the Armenians, as well as the political advocates got together in this event. And the keynote speaker was Charles Evans Hughes. Now, few people have had a more accomplished career in American politics than Hughes. Already in 1919, at the time of this event, he was the governor of New York, the justice of the Supreme Court, and the 1916 Republican presidential candidate. In the 1920s, he became Secretary of State, and in the 30s, he became Chief Justice. And he was the chairman of this advocacy committee, uh, pushing for the reparations and the homeland and all those things that Armenians wanted after World War I. And he was the keynote speaker at this event. <coughs> now, President Woodrow Wilson couldn't attend. The First Lady and his children attended, but he couldn't attend because he was in Paris overseeing the peace talks, the post-World War I peace talks. But he sent a telegram to one of the organizers vowing to also support the Armenians. And you have to think about how odd this is, right? Wilson and Hughes were political opponents in the 1916 presidential race. But on this issue, on the issue of the Armenians, they spoke with one voice. Now, who else was there? Uh, the people in attendance were the who's who of America's industrial, political, and cultural elite. Uh, William Taft, former president, attended, as did Warren Harding and Calvin Coolidge, both of whom became president in the 1920s. John Rockefeller was there, and he was among the first and largest donors to Armenian-related charities. Uh, J.P. Morgan, uh, William Randolph Hearst, Clarence Darrow, and even F. Scott Fitzgerald. They were all there to support the Armenians. Now this is a quote by President Herbert Hoover from his memoirs. And it kind of uh, is the culmination of everything I've spoken about in the last couple of minutes. And he wrote in his memoir, probably Armenia was known to the American school child in 1919, only a little less than England. And just imagine that. That's not something you could say today. Right? Even with all the mass media and the fact that there's a country of Armenia, you couldn't say that today. But in 1919, the Armenian plight and the Armenian genocide was something that was commonly known throughout the United States. So, as I said earlier on, one of the profound mysteries of the Armenian experience is how do you go from this quote by Hoover to this one uttered 20 years later by Hitler? And I'm sure many of you are familiar with this quote. Uh, this was made on the eve of World War II, and Hitler ordered his army to be ruthless and show no mercy even to women and children. And for anyone who doubted the wisdom of his command, he told them, who after all speaks today of the annihilation of the Armenians? And he was right. Soon after all that activity, the humanitarian effort, the political advocacy, uh, the world moved on and quickly forgot about the Armenians. And the Armenians were incapable of sustaining the memory of the genocide with the outside world. Now the genocide was a topic that Armenians spoke about them, amongst themselves. Survivors told their children and their grandchildren, otherwise we wouldn't be here today. But with the outside world, there was almost near absolute silence on this issue. So what do I mean by silence? Well. There were no monuments built or memorials. Uh, if you look at the dates here, the first major monument in the United States was built in Montebello, just east of Los Angeles, and that was constructed in 1967-68. Likewise, the monument in Yerevan was built at the same time. Uh, the first genocide museum opened in Armenia in 1995. So imagine, it took 80 years to open a museum. There were no popular literary or artistic works, no movies or books. Uh, the first major one in the United States was written by Michael J. Arlen, the Armenian-American writer, and that was published in 1975. And they weren't even academic studies. Forty years ago, you went to the library, and you wanted a good, comprehensive book about the genocide. You wouldn't have found one. 
At best, you would, you would get a quasi-scholarly publication, but not one written by a professional scholar who had actually looked through the archives. And then you look at the legislative actions, uh, whether it's the U.S. Congress or the French Parliament or whatnot. The first national legislature to pass a resolution recognizing the genocide, that took place in 1965 in Uruguay, of all places. So the Armenians themselves were silent with the outside world, <clears throat> and that contributed to the genocide's uh, absence from the world's conversation, and ultimately it became the forgotten genocide. Now, just to give you an idea of how absolute that was, remember I said in 1915 alone, there were more than 100 articles in the New York Times describing the genocide. But in the 15 years preceding 1965, there were only 22. And this is not just in the New York Times. This is in the 20 largest newspapers in the United States. So we're talking Boston Globe, New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, LA Times, etc. Only 22 articles in that 15-year span. And if you look at the 22, you realize that only two are really about the Armenian genocide. The rest of them are obituaries of Armenians, or they talk about human rights in general, and the Armenian experience is mentioned in passing. So, and those two articles were written in 1964 by Vahagan Dagel. Now, in 1965, that all changed. You start to see more media coverage in the United States, and then, obviously, in more recent years, you see an explosion of media activity. Now, the Cold War had a role to play in this. Uh, this is an article from 1955, and it appeared in the New York Times. And in it, it's describing Senator uh, Lehman, uh, a senator from New York, and he's addressing a, a crowd of 800 Armenians. And the topic of his address was human rights and the United Nations Genocide Convention. Now, he's talking to a group of Armenians who are very familiar with what genocide means, and he's talking about human rights. So you would figure he would talk about Turkey and the Armenian Genocide, but it goes completely unmentioned. Instead, he talks about the Soviet Union and human rights uh, violations it's committing. So the Cold War colored uh, the topic of the genocide and helped keep it away from the public's consciousness. Now, this event was ultimately broadcast on Radio Liberation, which was like a voice of America to the Soviet Union. Now, just to give you another example, uh, Gerald Ford, who was president in the 1970s, well, he was already a member of Congress in 1955. And this is a speech he delivered on uh, the congressional floor. And in it, he mentions, again, Soviet domination of Armenia. Turkey and the genocide go completely unmentioned. Again, it's the Cold War um, obscuring the genocide and keeping it, keeping it out of the public's consciousness. But in 1965, he makes a very different kind of statement. Here, there's no more talk of the Cold War and there's no more talk of the Soviet Union. Instead, he's there to commemorate the Armenian genocide committed by the, by the Turks. So what was happening in 1965, the magical year? Here are uh, two quotes from Leon Sumelian who was an Armenian-American writer, a very talented one. And the first one is a poem, which really reflects the sentiment of that era. And in it, he's saying, the, the trauma of the genocide, the pain was so great that it was easier to be silent than to talk about it with the rest of the world. But in the second passage, and this is a quote from a longer essay he wrote in 1965, that was published in just about every Armenian-American newspaper at that time. And the second one, he's telling his fellow Armenians that if they don't stand up and speak up now, the world will forget them for good. Because it's already forgotten them. But it'll be for good if they don't do something now. Now, this was a widespread feeling on the 50th anniversary of the genocide. And throughout the world, Armenians participated in demonstrations. So they had an event here in Boston, in New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco, uh, Athens, Paris, Beirut, 80,000 Armenians <coughs> held a rally in a stadium. But the biggest demonstration was in Yerevan, the capital of Soviet Armenia, where 100,000 people broke into the opera house, which is at the center 
of the city. And they wanted the Soviet Union to acknowledge this crime and to represent Armenian interests against Turkey. Now you have to realize, this is at the height of the USSR. Such demonstrations were strictly prohibited. And the people in Armenia risked their livelihood and maybe even imprisonment for partaking in this demonstration. But, as I said, on the 50th anniversary, there was such a groundswell of emotion that people finally took to the streets and wanted to reawaken the genocide from its dormancy, wanted to remind the world of what had happened to the Armenians. Now, that rally in Yerevan, and as well as the demonstrations throughout the world, they created what we have now in terms of the April 24th events. April 24th events were never a public event prior to 1965. And since then, they always have been. And they also led to the building of the memorials and monuments that I talked about earlier. Now, as the Armenians started to demonstrate and started to bring attention to the Armenian genocide, they immediately collided with two uh, hurdles. One was the world was indifferent. As I said, the world had moved on and forgotten about them. So they, they were, became very frustrated, as uh, Gugin Yanikian was, that no one was paying attention to them. Uh, if there were articles written about them, it appeared you know, in the back pages of a newspaper. So this led to a lot of frustration. But they also collided head-on with Turkish denial. Now, Turkey had been denying the veracity of the genocide for decades. But because Armenians almost never spoke about it, they didn't have to do much in implementing that campaign of denial. But after 1965, when Armenians took to the streets and started to remind the world of what had happened, Turkey now ratcheted up its efforts of denial. So one of the responses to this was to go to the legislatures of foreign governments and ask them to pass legislation that would authenticate the, the genocide. And it was seen as a way to counter Turkish denial. Now, the first one of these efforts in the United States took place in 1974. And in 1975, there was a really big effort led by uh, Tip O'Neill, a local congressman. And he was not yet Speaker of the House, but he, was, uh, the number, he had the number two job there. And his legislative aide, uh, Linda Melkonian, who later became a state senator, she played a, a crucial role in trying to push through this legislation in 1975. But by the late 1980s, Armenian advocates in D.C. had found themselves on the losing end of these efforts. The Turkish lobby was simply too strong. And they didn't have a country of their own to represent their interests, right? Armenia was still part of the Soviet Union, so it didn't have a voice on these matters. So you had basically Armenian advocates going, going up against Turkey and the Turkish government, and the U.S. Congress playing the role of their battlefield. So the Armenians by the late 1980s looked for someone who could push this legislation through, someone who would have a lot of standing in the U.S. Congress. And they found their man in Senator Bob Dole. Now, if you remember, Senator Dole had an <coughs> injury to his right arm. He would shake people's hand using his left hand. Well, he suffered that injury in Italy during the waning days of World War II. And when he returned to America, he was barely alive. His arm was immobile. But more than that, he had become despondent. The injury had left him depressed, that he could not become a surgeon, that he could not live out the life that he had always imagined for himself. And he was basically in a state of depression. And he went from doctor to doctor looking for a miracle cure, someone who would uh, give him back his arm and give him back his old life prior to that war injury. Now eventually, someone referred Dole to an orthopedic surgeon in Chicago. And this surgeon uh, conducted about six to seven operations on Dole's arm at no charge. And uh, he gave him some of his mobility back. But more than that, he restored Dole's spirit. Now the doctor's name was Hampar Kedikyan, who was an Armenian genocide survivor. And he was the first person to tell Dole of the genocide. Now, Dole and Kedikyan stayed lifelong friends. And when I interviewed the senator last year, he said, look, outside of my immediate family, this was the closest person in my life. So now this quote is a poem that Dole read on the Senate floor when Dr. Kelly Kian passed away, and Dole delivered a eulogy. 
And after the last line where he says, it's a Robert Frost poem, where he says, nothing gold can stay, the next line, he said, Dr. Kelikian was pure gold. And as Dole delivered this eulogy, his voice choked up, and he was nearly in tears. And this was in 1983, so it was decades after uh, they had met. So when Armenian advocates went to Dole in the late 80s and they said, can you sponsor this legislation? Dole gladly signed on. Not just because of his close, intimate relationship with Dr. Kelikian, but also because Dole was among the foremost advocates of human rights in the U.S. Congress. So, in September 1989, uh, Dole introduced this resolution. It's only one paragraph long, and legislation is rarely this uh, brief. It's usually hundreds, if not thousands of pages long. But this one paragraph triggered five months of intense lobbying, as well as negotiations between Senator Dole and then President Bush. Now, as soon as Dole introduced this resolution, the opposition immediately stood up against it. Now, as I said, by the late 1980s, Armenians had tried to pass these resolutions several times, so Turkey was very well prepared to respond. Now, Dole had a few supporters. The late Ted Kennedy was among his chief supporters, and Ted Kennedy was uh, commemorating the genocide since 1965, so he was one of the first people in the Congress to support the Armenians. Dole also had the support of Paul Simon, senator from Illinois, who, like Dole, had a personal relationship to the Armenians because his college roommate was Armenian. And then there were about a handful of two of Armenian advocates, Armenian lobbyists, working in D.C. Uh, alongside Dole. Now, in order to pass legislation, especially in the Senate, Dole had to get it through a committee. He had to actually get, get the legislation on the Senate floor, which means he needed the, the help of the Senate Majority Leader at the time, George Mitchell. Then he actually needed enough votes to win. And in the Senate, where there's an opportunity for a filibuster, that meant Dole needed not 51 votes, but 60. So as it was, it was pretty hard for him to pass legislation, but look at the list of opponents. Uh, the President Bush, who, like presidents before him and after him, had promised to recognize the genocide while running for office, reneged on that promise. He opposed the resolution. The entire executive branch, uh, and primarily the State Department and the Defense Department and the National Security Council, lobbied the Senate. And they didn't send their deputies or their undersecretaries. This was the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense, the Chief of the National Security Council, Brent Scowcroft. They went and visited every senator to oppose the resolution. But Dole also had uh, opponents within the Senate itself. Robert Byrd, uh, one of the two longest serving senators in U.S. history, led the opposition in the U.S. Senate against this resolution. Now, Byrd had held every position of power in the Senate by this time. He had been minority leader, majority leader, so he knew all the parliamentary tactics. And in 1989, he was chairman of the Appropriations Committee which meant that every discretionary dollar spent by the U.S. government had to, get those, uh, had to get Byrd's approval. So if you wanted to build a bridge, construct a hospital, send money to schools in your state, Byrd had to approve. So he was among the most powerful people in the Senate. Turkey, of course, lobbied against the resolution. It sent its president, its prime minister, its ambassador to visit every senator. And it also made threats. It said that it might close down the U.S. military bases operating in Turkey. It also said that it couldn't guarantee the safety of the small Armenian and Jewish populations in Turkey. You also had the Turkish American lobby. About eight different firms were paid $3 million over a few months period to lobby against this resolution. One of them was founded by Douglas Faith, and uh, he was the uh, the protege of a man named Richard Pearl. Now both of them in modern day were neocons who helped push the United States into the recent Iraq war. Now Faith in 1989 founded a lobbying shop and he received I think about eight to nine hundred thousand dollars and his only client was the government of Turkey. And then finally you had the corporations doing business in Turkey. They too opposed the resolution. And largely they were defense contractors like uh, Halliburton 
And its CEO at the time sent a letter to various senators saying that if the resolution passed, it would risk considerable harm to an important economic relationship. So as, as I said, you had Dole and a few supporters on one side and all of these opponents on the other. And Dole, later on, while there was a debate, came to call it a David and Goliath matchup. But there was also something else that Dole had to confront, and that was Turkish denial. Now in Washington, you'd be hard-pressed to find a dozen congressmen who actually believe Turkey's position. When these resolutions come up these days, it's simply a matter of who has more political power. But that wasn't the case 20 years ago. Back then marked the high watermark of Turkish denial, and many people in the U.S. media, as well as the U.S. government, didn't know what the truth was, what the historical fact was about the events of 1915. Now, this is a letter that appeared in the Washington Post and the New York Times in 1985. And as I said, it really marked the high water, uh, it was the high water mark of Turkish denial. And it's a letter signed by 69 American scholars. And they basically tell Congress, look, there's an academic debate about the authenticity of the genocide. So if us scholars who do this for a living uh, don't have a consensus about this issue, then you congressmen shouldn't uh, pass such a resolution. Now, the man responsible um, for this letter was a man named Heath Lowry. And at face value, Heath Lowry appeared to be an objective scholar who happened to take Turkey's position on this issue. But in late 1990, after the resolution was already done with, um, a scholar named Robert J. Lifton had received a letter from the Turkish ambassador. Uh, and these were letters that the Turkish embassy would normally send. If someone wrote a book, and they mentioned the Armenian Genocide, even in passing, they would receive a letter saying, no, 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 you have it wrong, that's not the case. So there was nothing unusual about that letter that the Turkish ambassador had sent out. But what was unusual was that in the envelope, he accidentally included a memo written by Heath Lowry and addressed to the Turkish ambassador. Now this memo was not meant for public consumption, obviously. But it revealed that Lowry was working very intimately with Turkey, and gained uh, professionally by participating in denial. So he was not an objective scholar. Now, one other person on this list was a professor named Donald Quatert, who now teaches at SUNY Binghamton. About two or three years ago, he wrote a book review, and in it he described the events that happened to the Armenians as genocide. And he was soon uh, forced to leave as the chairman of the Institute of Turkish Studies. And that's an institute founded by Turkey that gives grants to scholars who want to do research there. Now, I interviewed Professor Quadri and I said, look, you're in academia, you're in the business of finding truth. So how could you and so many other people have signed this document? And he said, look, many of us, many of the people who signed were not even experts on the field. They were asked, so they did it as a favor. It didn't cost them anything. But he said there's something else that was far more uh, insidious. He said the subject of the genocide is taboo in Turkish academia. And if it's something you want to research, something you want to write about, you implicitly find out that your career is at risk. You could get um, the funding that you get to travel to Turkey and to do research there could dry up. And even worse, you could be denied access to Ottoman and Turkish archives. And as a scholar, if you don't have access to archives, you don't really have a job. Now, by the late 90s, and certainly by the middle of this decade, there was an academic consensus about the authenticity of the genocide. Uh, and, it, and that consensus was built in uh, Holocaust circles, uh, human rights circles, etc. But if you notice, all of these dates are way after Dole's resolution in 1989-90. So, finally, in February 1990, uh, Dole was ready to present the resolution on the Senate floor, which meant that there would be debates, and then finally there would be a vote. Now, while the, all of this was happening, as I said, there was an immense amount of lobbying against the resolution, but Dole was also in the process of negotiating with President Bush. Now, in every other effort where there's been a resolution like this, presidents have always said, we're against it, and that's that. There's nothing to negotiate. But this case was different. Dole was a Senate minority leader, and he was the highest-serving Republican 
in the U.S. Congress. And he and Bush were in the same political party. So they didn't want this issue to drive a wedge between them. So they spent five months negotiating the language of that one paragraph resolution that I told you. So um, there were about two dozen drafts that went back and forth. Sometimes they would s describe the events of 1915 as genocide. Sometimes they would call it a massacre or an atrocity. Sometimes they would say it was a genocide, but not uh, a declaration made by the U.S. government, but by third parties like scholars. So they try to find all these subtle ways, and sometimes the subtleties are very hard to discern, but they try to find a way that would be both satisfactory to the Armenians as well as the Turkish government. But the Armenians insisted that the word genocide be used, and Turkey insisted that it not be used. So that was very hard to do, no matter what kind of uh, uh, verbal semantics uh, you used. So, now, Bush had uh, the National Security Advisor, Brent Scowcroft, lead these negotiations, and Dole also had help. He had help from Governor George Dukmajian, who was an Armenian-American politician, and he was governor of California at the time. Now, Dukmajian met with President Bush on Air Force One. And he said, Mr. President, you campaigned with me in California in 1988 when you ran for president. And back then, California was a swing state, and Bush actually won it in 88. And he said, in front of audiences, you promised that you would recognize the genocide. Now you've gone back on your word. So this was something that had upset Governor Duke Majin. And when they met on Air Force One, Bush said ultimately, look, I know what I said, but this is the way it is now, and I can't help you. So this was, this was a very difficult thing. Just as Dole and Bush did not want to disagree because they were the lead Republicans in D.C., Duke Majin didn't want to disagree with Bush because he was the governor of the biggest state and also a fellow Republican. But finally, after these negotiations, there were the Senate debates, and Dole uh, and Byrd led each side. And the Armenian advocates I talked about, well, they were camped out in Dole's office. Uh, one of them, Van Kikorian, he was trying to uh, lobby senators to support the resolution. And he was also uh, helping Dole with his speeches, because a lot of what the debate was about was the historical record. So Dole is a smart man, but he's not a historian on the Armenian genocide, so he needed help in that regard. Now, the other Armenian advocate was a man named Dr. Ruben Adalian, who was a scholar. And he was the one providing the historical facts for the debates. And some senators, as I said, they didn't know what the truth was. They actually called him to their office, and Al Gore was one of them. And they said, look, come explain to my staff where you stand, and we're going to listen to the Turkish side too, and we'll make a decision. And after Adalian met with Gore's staff, ultimately Gore uh, came to support the resolution based on what he had heard. So they had four days of debates. As I said, they went back and forth. And you have to realize the Senate almost never spends four days on anything. Uh, a year later, when debating whether to enter the Persian Gulf War, they actually spent three days going over that issue. So the Armenian genocide had come to consume so much of the Senate's time, and Dole was the, the main reason for this. And as the last speaker, and uh, right after he spoke, there was a vote on the uh, Byrd's filibuster, he said, maybe we can redeem ourselves a bit today by letting the world know that we do not always support the rich and powerful and those with the most lobbyists. Sometimes we judge right from wrong. Now, just want to give you a little word about the research. And there's a whole chapter on this uh, resolution. I'm not going to tell you how the vote ended up. You have to read the book for that. <laughs> but, uh, but I combined, you know. Please, just tell me it passed. <laughs> <laughs> I combined a, a lot of interviews. I interviewed Senator Dole, Governor McMajin. There was also a man named uh, Charles Prashan, who was a uh, congressman from Fresno. I interviewed the Armenian advocates. I looked through the, all the congressional materials, uh, all the articles that you could find in the U.S. press as well as the Armenian press. And then I had access to the presidential archives. Uh, and they don't exist for the second uh, President Bush or even for President Clinton. And uh, the Dole archives as well. And then there were just uh, random things, like uh, finding out the history of what Dole's office looked like. Because he had one of the biggest offices in the whole U.S. Congress. And it used to be the former... <laughs> Uh, chamber of the Supreme Court before it had its own building. So put these all together in writing this chapter and Mark had asked me to talk a little bit about the research and uh, as I said earlier much of it was done here. So 
As I conclude, I just want to tell you a little bit about the photo on the cover. It's of the Marutian family, taken in about 1908. And the man sitting with his leg crossed is a man named Setrak. And he had purchased an insurance policy from the New York Life Insurance Company. His sister-in-law, Elizabeth, who's standing above his right shoulder, was moving to New York. And he said, why don't you take the policy? If something happens to me, it'll be easier for you to collect there than it will be from here in Turkey. So she and her daughter, who's standing uh, underneath her, they moved to Staten Island, New York in 1913. Everyone else in this photo remained behind and perished during the genocide. Now Elizabeth tried to collect this policy in the 1920s and again in the 1950s, and uh, she wasn't able to do so. But she kept the policy. She kept all the pay stubs and all the correspondence. When she passed away, her daughter inherited the policy, and when her daughter passed away, her younger son, Martin Marutian, inherited the policy. And in 1999, the policy and all those documents that came with it became the central piece of evidence in the first ever class action lawsuit to originate from the genocide. Now, there are no photos in the book, so this is the only one. And the reason we picked it, my editor and I, is because to me it symbolized the essence of the book. These people died a long time ago. Uh, the world had forgotten them. Their remains are in unmarked graves. But somehow their ghosts are not at rest. Even a century later, they're calling out to us from the past through this policy in the case of this family. But there's also a note of redemption. At least this family, and I don't want to give away the, the, the ending of the book, but at least this family did see a little bit of justice. And many other Armenian families await. But to me, there's hope that if one family got the justice they deserved, then perhaps everyone else will as well. Thank you. Now we'll take any questions. Yes. 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 My family? Uh, my grandparents were, were survivors, my paternal grandparents. and uh, My grandfather was 14 at the time of the genocide. and He was one of the only two people to survive, and about 28 people perished. And uh, he saw most of the deaths, uh, the death of his mother, his aunts, and his infant brother. And it was something that traumatized him his entire life, um, especially as he got older. He would have breakdowns uh, where he would relive the events as if they were happening right there again. Uh, it was not something that he talked about in an orderly or calm way with his children and grandchildren. Instead, his experience would come out through these breakdowns. So it was very difficult for his children, including my father, who was about seven years old the first time he saw it. And he said, you know, what's happening? Why is my, fa you know, why is my father uh, in tears and, and screaming things that my father couldn't comprehend. So that was his experience. His wife, my grandmother, was orphaned at a very young age. We don't know when she was born, so but we think she was about four or five years old. So she didn't have the same kind of trauma because she didn't remember anything. To her, the loss was different. She had lost her family. She had lost her family name, her heritage. Uh, she was um, adopted by a very kind Kurdish family, and they named her because she didn't know even who she was or who her parents were. There was an older Armenian girl who lived in the same neighborhood. And that girl was old enough to realize what was happening, that they were adopted by these families, but they didn't really belong. The older girl grabbed my grandmother and they fled, and they went to an American orphanage, and eventually they ended up in, uh, in Aleppo, Syria. And when she grew older, she met my grandfather. And it was very common for survivors, for orphans, to seek out other orphans. And, and that's how they met. So their experiences were very different. One was traumatized. The other one was had this absence where she didn't know who she was and where her family was from. Yes? How many of those dollars recanted? And also, given the current climate, what percentage of scholars still maintain the denial? I can't give you an exact percentage. You know, many of the scholars were actually not experts 
on the genocide era. And there was a study done by Israel Charney, who was a Holocaust scholar. And it showed that many of them just signed on, as I said, because they were asked. And they figured, okay, you know, what's the big deal? Uh, I can't tell you how many of them directly recanted, but many of them did say that the subject of the genocide is taboo in Turkey and that there's not fair uh, scholarly discourse in Turkey on the subject. In terms of today, a very small minority outside of Turkey uh, follow the denial of position. Um, as I said in that one slide, there's widespread academic consensus about the authenticity of the genocide. So there isn't as much of an academic debate, but you still see it. You still see it. There's still some publications that play around with the edges, and uh, so you have to be very vigilant. Uh, but I would say that it's a small uh, minority these days. Yes? Uh, what's been the response to the book in among the uh, American and scholastic community? I think it's a little early for the scholastic community, but the, the response has generally been very positive, um, from, especially from people who've read it, who've had a chance to read it. Uh, but in terms of book reviews from scholars, you know, those things take months to, to publish, so I can't really tell you that. It only came out about four weeks ago. Do you, you think you'll be getting on like C-SPAN or NPR? Uh, C-SPAN is, is going to record one of my readings uh, later this month. Uh, and we'll see if they air it. Um, you know, they have a million reasons why they air or don't air something. But they will be recording it, so it is a possibility, yes. Yes, okay. I recently uh, attended a forum where Brent Scowcroft was uh, on the panel. I noticed in his biography he's, he's something like the president of the... American Turkish, Turkish Council. Council. Yes, he's still at it. Well, well, he's uh, he's pro-Turkish, and, and you know. But why? Money. Well, he well, you know, I can't speak on that. You know, um, but a lot of people feel that Turkey is a is a critical strategic ally, and they do not want to offend it. Um, sometimes it's money, and I'm not going to say that Scowcroft is one way or the other. But it's not always. Like I said, a lot of people take its strategic value very seriously and will support it. Um, the one thing I will say about Scowcroft, and, and this is something I found in the archives, is a lot of the same people appear on this issue over and over again. If you look at the President Gerald Ford's archives, uh, remember I showed you that congressional statement he made in 1965. Well, ten years later, Armenians went to him and said, you said it before, why don't you make a similar statement? Now, again, this created a lot of uh, memorandum writing. Within the, uh, within the White House. And two people authored memos saying, you can't, you can't use the genocide word as president. It's off limits. One of those people was Brent Scowcroft. The other one was Robert M. Gates, who is now the Secretary of Defense. So these people know this issue, and they have been a part of the US government for many years. Yes, back there. Anything that surprised yes, I, I learned a lot of things that surprised me, like the one that I just told you. Um, I think the two things that surprised me the most were how absolute the Armenian silence was, how little was was uh, was spoken of the genocide between from about the mid 1920s to 1965. Uh, I mean, I kind of knew that that was the case, but when I saw how. Uh, how profound it was and, and how, as I said, absolute the silence was. That surprised me. And the other thing that surprised me was how often Turkey and the U.S. government tried to oppose Armenian efforts when it came to genocide. And it wasn't just the resolutions. That was the most obvious place. But even in small things, like building the uh, genocide monument in Montebello, uh, Turkey went to the State Department and asked it to contact the city council. And Montebello is a small town. It had like a 50, 60,000 population. But the State Department contacted the city council and pressured them to not build the monument. Uh, the State Department had a local congressman give, uh, give it uh, inside information as to the local political scene and who they could push and who they should pressure. So that also surprised me. Like, I understood the resolutions, but on even the tiniest things, the State Department and, and the government of Turkey would confer on these issues and try to oppose the Armenian efforts. So I'd say those are the two big surprises. Yes? To what do you attribute the silence? Well, that's, that's a good portion of my book. I'll just tell you briefly. Uh, there are the obvious reasons. Uh, the survivors were in no position 
to become political advocates. The typical survivor was an orphan, right? So you were 14 years old. You lost your parents, so you're already in shock. But you have to rebuild your life at the same time. Normally, when we lose a, a family member, just about everything else in our, in our life is stable, right? We still have our job. We still have a roof over our head. In this case, everything is unstable, and you've lost your entire family. So imagine the shock and the trauma of that. The survivors wanted to rebuild their lives, restart their families, and build communal institutions. They were in no position to uh, participate in political advocacy. The other thing is that Armenians were scattered across the globe. And when you're scattered in foreign countries, there was no concentration to incubate political power very easily. Um, the thing that also Armenians underestimate was the lack of a country. The First Republic of Armenia had survived past 1920, and this is a hypothetical, but I'm sure that eventually they would have built memorials and monuments, and they would have pressed Turkey in international circles like the League of Nations and then the United Nations after World War II. But without a country to speak on your behalf, and you're scattered across the globe and you're survivors, well, it's very hard to, to make a lot of noise. Um, and if you look at the, the, the Holocaust by comparison, it was Israel that uh, negotiated uh, with Germany uh, reparations. It was Israel that built the first major Holocaust centers. But again, because the Armenians didn't have a country of their own, they were not able to, uh, to make these maneuvers or build these types of institutions. Uh, yes? But we did it 50 years later without a country. So is that really a justification? Starting I'm not justifying it, I'm just explaining it. No, but I mean, after 1965, we started, and we are yes. where we are today, but, you know, it works without a country. What is actually Armenia is doing today for getting our land back in reparations? They might even sell us on October 10th. Well, I, I don't comment on the protocols, because I may want to write on them, so... I don't take a public position, but uh, I can say, and, and this is pretty well known, that Armenia uh, does not see the genocide issue with the same intensity and passion that the diaspora does. Uh, the Armenian diaspora, this is the political issue of the diaspora. There's no number two. Agano Karabakh, yes. Uh, how much money Armenia gets uh, from the United States, yes. But 95% of our energy is based on this issue. Well, Armenia is a country with many problems and many issues. It's surrounded by uh, several, uh, two hostile countries in Azerbaijan and Turkey. Iran to its south is a pariah state, and Georgia to its north is a, is a dysfunctional country. So they have a lot of problems, and they have a lot of things on their agenda. I'm not here to justify it. I'm just here to tell you that they don't place this issue at the top of their list or, or with the same passion that the diaspora does. So that, that's all I can really tell you. Yes, back there. Yes, it, it is ironic that Talat Pasha was among the chief perpetrators of the genocide, and he has a quote where he basically says that the Armenian question will be uh, silenced for 50 years, and, and he was right in that regard. It took, it took about 50 years to, for Armenians to reawaken the genocide from its dormancy. Um, yes? Yeah, I have a question. I'm just curious about something. You, have the, you talked about the development or the evolution of Armenian studies in America, let's say. What about high school? Did you ever, were you able to find anything about when, I mean, did they ever teach, did they ever even talk about this in the 1930s in, in, in the high schools? I mean, you know, yeah, I, I, just curious. I didn't check the curriculum from past decades, but in the last few years, uh, states like New Jersey and California and here in Massachusetts, and it's under litigation, there have been states that include the genocide in their K-12 through curriculum. But I don't know how many states it is. I don't think it's a, it's a majority of them. I think it's just a handful of states. Uh, so maybe someone was teaching it in the 1930s, but I probably doubt it because they probably they didn't even have the materials to teach it. If there's no curriculum, there's no textbook, there's no articles to rely upon. The teachers may have spoken something, but I doubt that they taught it in any comprehensive way. They can't go too far back. It seems like in the 1990s, I know in Lexington High School up and around here, they were they were beginning to teach it. You know, yes, as I said, in recent years, uh, some states have mandated it as part of their uh, K through 12 curriculum. Thank you. Yes. Question, uh, 
Hanar Akhtar wrote that book, the, you know, the Turkish side. And lately there was something on the internet where the Turks could sign up and apologize you know, to the Armenians. Is there any hope or any uh, benefit that's coming out of that little glimmer? Right. Well, you know, it's one of those things where if you're a pessimist or an optimist, um, all I can say is this. If you ask me 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 4 years ago, is there any hope? I would have said no. The Turkish response was monolithic. Whether it was the Turkish government, the media, or academia, they all said the same thing. But the last 10 years has seen some cracks in that response. There are some in the press and the academia who speak of the genocide. Some who don't call it genocide but say at least uh, that people should look, look to the past and study it and not necessarily automatically say that the Armenians are wrong. So there is hope in that sense because there was never that kind of liberalization before. But whether that will lead to a real breakthrough or a breakthrough that will lead to a sincere apology for the Armenians, you know, I, I don't know. I really don't know. Yes? Uh, may I ask uh, what the, the current definition of the word genocide or um, the, 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 the meaning of it has evolved through all this like, decade? Uh, and is there any disagreement between the definition between the Turkish side and the Armenian side? Well, there's a definition that people might use in the common parlance, right? Uh, America committed genocide against the American Indians. But there is a legal definition from the United Nations 1948 Convention. You, you can very easily find it. I think there are four or five uh, things that have to be met to constitute genocide. Um, and you can easily find it on the Internet. I, I, I don't have it in front of me in terms of what the, what the exact language is. Because it's very legalistic. So I would, I would have to read it before I could tell you. My question is, so basically, uh, the, the, the Turkish side and the Armenian side, they do have this, the, the same definition as just they are. Yes, they, are they just argue over the, the, the factual interpretation of whether it fits the definition, yes. A lot, of it, a lot of the argument has to do with intent. Because the Turks agree that many Armenians died. Now, they say a lower number died, but they agree many Armenians died. So, what they're saying is there was no intent, right? So. If you're, if you're uh, driving a car and you kill someone uh, by accident, well, there is a death, but there's no intent, right? There's no murder. Whereas if you take a gun and shoot someone, well, it's the same act of killing. But one is murder and one is homicide, or one is even not even that. It's an accident, right? So that's what the real, the crux of the argument has to do with intent. Yes? Uh, what should Armenians do next, and what are you going to do next? Uh, I'm going to uh, move to other issues uh, for a while. Um, as for Armenians, um, I don't know. You know, sometimes it can be frustrating. The Armenians have come a long way since 1965. Uh, but at the same time, sometimes you wonder if, if they've reached the sort of the end point of how much uh, they can get on this issue without Turkey fundamentally changing on its own. And I would encourage Armenians that the pressure on Turkey has helped. Otherwise, it would have, I don't think it would have ever moved from its position. But at the same time, if Armenians want not just an apology, but a sincere apology, Turkey is going to have to change internally. Uh, the Armenians are not in a position to pressure Turkey any more than they currently are. Meaning that Turkey is not going to uh, agree to acknowledge the genocide because it's going to find itself on its knees, you know, looking up to Armenia. That, that kind of power dynamic does not exist. And even if it did, even if Turkey were forced to do it, let's say by the European Union or the United States has a change of heart, is that something Armenians want? Do they want the sincere apology? Or do they want Turkey to say, oh, okay, okay, it happened now, that's it. You know, let's move on. And if you want a sincere apology, Turkey's going to have to change internally. And that's something that could take a long time and something that would be very difficult. Sure, why not? Uh, sure, go ahead. Please, please stand so we can hear a little bit better. Letters to the editors, to your papers, and you make a little fuss known, and you let the 
general public, before that, you know how it is you are here. There's a room full of people, uh, something was said earlier, we're basically the first generation of people who saw the massacre. And we, we grew up differently than, say, the Jews in this country who, after the war, you guys said this to a lot of people, the Jews who survived the Holocaust weren't in a position to resurrect themselves and save the situation. It's the Jews in America, in my opinion, who said, we've got to do something about this. And they were the ones who had the means. And the means, financially, organizationally, they pulled it together and they helped present the issue. And I'm trying to say the Armenians must learn from the Jew that this is the approach you have to take. And it's small, but it grows, and it keeps growing. Uh, you, you, you're right to say that um, uh, unlike the, the Jewish experience, uh, almost every Armenian was affected by the genocide. So there wasn't a large community in other parts of the world that could speak on behalf of the Armenians. And as I said, there was no homeland like Israel that could speak on their behalf. So you're, you're right in, in, in that sense. Um, and in terms of what Armenians can do, they have to do what they keep what they've already been doing, writing letters to the editor and, and, and reaching out to their to their government officials. But what I said before was they also need to engage Turkey because ultimately the pressure side of the equation is one thing, but if you really want a sincere apology, you need to help change Turkey internally. And that, I think, is, is something that the Armenians really should look to next. It's something that's only being done to a small extent so far. But that's what Armenians should encourage is change within Turkey. Yes, Miss. Do you have any opinion on how uh, things will impact the decision if trade begins between Armenia and Turkey? You know, I, I don't know. That's a hypothetical that I can't answer you. But let me give you some other examples. Um, the lawyer in you is coming up. Well, yeah, I mean, I, can, I can't answer. But um, a after World War II, uh, Germany negotiated reparations with uh, the government of Israel as well as the Jewish diaspora. And 24 Jewish organizations from across the world got together and created an umbrella institution that could go negotiate these reparations. So they had a government as well as a diaspora represented. It wasn't until about 14 years later that Germany and Israel established relations, officially established relations. Then you look at Japan and South Korea. Uh, Japan committed a lot of human rights violations against the Koreans in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, but in 1965, they established a relationship, and now they have an immense amount of trade. Uh, they also uh, cooperate militarily because they're both scared of North Korea. And in 2002, they co-hosted the World Cup. But Japan has never really formally apologized for its crimes. So. It could go either way. I can't tell you which way it could go. It could go where the two countries have a functional relationship. They trade. They tra you know they have an open border. They they share ambassadors, and they don't deal with the past as Japan and South Korea have had, or the German Israeli model where they first deal with the past. They first deal with the crimes committed against the victims, and then they go ahead and establish state to state relations. And um, so all I can say is we should look at those models and see which one as a people we want. Uh, I think a lot of these issues have been have been uh, stated in a way where it's very confusing. Which is it? Are Turkey and Armenia supposed to solve all these historical grievances, or are they supposed to simply establish the basic relationship that any two countries should have? Um, I think it might be a little bit of both, but it's not it's not clear to me. If you read these protocols, it's, it's very vague, and uh, I think that needs to be clarified. And I think for the Armenians to get a resolution they want just as in the Jewish model, the, the diaspora, as well as Armenia, need to be represented. Uh, if only Armenia is there, then it's going to be a state-to-state -state resolution, and I think a lot of the, many people in the diaspora will be unhappy. So the ideal model is what uh, the Israelis and the Jewish diaspora did in the early 50s, and where they went, and each side was represented uh, in talks with Germany. Did the Israeli government welcome that diaspora input? Yes, it actually encouraged it. it. It actually encouraged it. Uh, because it knew that there would be a, a massive problem 
if it did not. And as I said, within a few months, and the Jewish diaspora is very fragmented, right? It's fragmented along uh, religious lines, by geography, politics, whatever. But in a few months, they developed this umbrella organization. And I think the Armenian diaspora is nowhere near that in developing an organization that can actually go speak on our behalf. We don't have elections, right? Uh, our advocates are very admirable, but, but last time I checked, neither you or I elected them, right? So there's a problem of representation. Uh, there's a problem of speaking with one voice. Uh, as I said, in those negotiations, the Jewish diaspora and Israel were able to do that, and I think the Armenians could really look to that as an example and try to learn from how it was done, what were the roadblocks, and then how they went forward. Sure. Yes. Go ahead, miss. All right, time's running. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, I just want to go This isn't a question, because it was a wonderful talk, but some of the things that you said and some of the questions I wanted to respond in a different way to, if I may. I'm Han Steiner, and I know a lot of you, and a lot of you know that I've been doing work on reconciliation between Armenians and Turks. And um, I'm Henry Morgan great-granddaughter, and I'm um, honored to get to do that work. And I just wanted all of you to know that um, on November 16th, at the Psy Auditorium at Harvard um, on Cambridge Street, where many of you have come before uh, for a couple of talks by Armenians, Hassan Jamal will be speaking. Now, Hassan Jamal is the grandson of Jamal Pasha, who was one of the three heads of the Ottoman government during the First World War. And um, what he did as a journalist, he's a well-known journalist in Turkey, he accompanied President Gold to Armenia for the football diplomacy last year, a year ago. And while he was there, he made two gestures of reconciliation that I think are very hopeful and important, signifying change in Turkey. So uh, I met him and invited him to come and speak, and he is coming to speak on those two gestures. And one of them was the laying a wreath at the, at, at the genocide memorial in Yerevan, and the other one was to meet with the grandson of his of one of the assassins of his grandfather while he was there. So I think that those, to me, are very moving gestures, and I think they're important in helping to open up everything for everybody. And to um, it's just a piece, because there are a million pieces to it all. So I wanted to invite you all to come to that event. Thank you so much. What's your last question? Question, question. <laughs> I was just going to ask, what do you think the Turkish government has to gain by maintaining a lie? Because it takes a lot of effort to maintain a lie. That, that's a great question. Um, part of it is material, right? Fear of paying reparations. Uh, part of it are the Armenian territorial claims. You have to realize when Turkey was transforming from the Ottoman Empire into the modern republic, it was under siege by the victors of World War I, by the European victors, who wanted to carve it up. And they wanted to give some to the Armenians, some of the lands to the Kurds, some to Greece, and very little left for the Turks. So part of the fear, and, and you may think this is completely irrational, they're not going to give up a square inch, they're the, one of the largest armies in the world, right? And how is small Armenia ever going to take an inch from them? But this is a genuine fear in Turkey that if you reawaken the genocide, you also reawaken this territorial claims. And that is a very scary thing for them. Uh, and the other thing is, is a question of honor. Turkish culture is, is built on honor, and the genocide is seen as a stain against that honor. Um, and, and the last thing I would say is this is something that's happened in the last few decades. And if Turkey had come to terms with the truth in the past, it would have been easier in a way. But now for the past, since 1965, it's been actively lying. So now, for it to go back and acknowledge the genocide, it has to say not only that it made a mistake, but that it was lying to the world and its own people. So the lie has grown so big that it's actually harder now to go back. So I would say those are the those are the reasons that takes the position it does. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Just in brief, if I may, for one moment.